Welcome to the spring 2022 post-commencement ceremony. I'm Jay Magaziner. I'm chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. And I have a couple of items of note before we move ahead with the ceremony. Today's ceremony is being broadcast on Zoom. Hello to those out there. And um, we are also um, recording um, today's, today's ceremony. Um, everyone on Zoom will be muted and your cameras will be off. It's really a privilege to be here today with all of the people that are graduating and with my colleagues and friends and families who are here celebrating what is the graduation and the culmination of a tremendous amount of work during rather um, unexpected and unprecedented times for 28 graduates. Um, before acknowledging our graduates, graduates, I would like to take a few moments to acknowledge and thank several individuals for being with us today. These are some of the people that are responsible for making the University of Maryland the great institution that it is, and for making the programs that our graduates have finished their training in the kinds of meaningful programs that we know they are. I'd like each of them to stand and remain standing for a few moments while I recognize other members in their group. First, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. James Caper. Dr. Caper is here with us today representing the Dean's Office. Dr. Caper is Vice Dean for Academic Affairs in the School of Medicine. Next, I'd like to recognize Dr. Carol Thomas Rattay, our keynote speaker. Dr. Rattay, is the director of the Delaware Division of Public Health and one of our alumna. We have Dr. Patricia Langenberg. Is Pat here already? Or is... We're expecting Pat. If she comes, I'll introduce her. Pat Langenberg is a professor emerita in the School of Medicine and a longtime friend and colleague. We also have members of the Royock Shaler family with us, and I believe they're with us virtually. You can't see them, and I believe they can see us. We're honored to have all of them join us. Um, they've been extremely supportive of our department, and as you'll see as we go through the program, some of the special activities that are related to their, their support. We also have the immediate past president and newly elected president of the Beta Tau chapter of the Delta Omega Honorary Society in Public Health, Dr. Lori Edwards and Dr. Jessica Brown. All, for all of them. Thank you for joining us today. Next, I'd like to recognize the department's leadership. Dr. Kate Tracy, who serves as vice chair for research services and leads the preventive medicine division in the department and directs the clinical and translational research informatics center in the school of medicine. And Dr. Diane Marie St. George, who serves as vice chair for academic programs and is director of the master of public health program. You know, it's through their leadership that the department has achieved the kind of national recognition in areas of research, education, and service. In addition to Dr. St. George, who's director of the MPH program, we also have several other academic leaders um, with us today. They include Dr. Andrew Baldini. Dr. Baldini is the director of the PhD in Epidemiology and Human Genetics program and the Master of Science in Epidemiology and Clinical Research. Dr. Orwig is not here today. She had a 
uh, I think her, her um, dog had a medical emergency, so she's not here. And she may be with us later. Dr. Orwig leads the PhD program in gerontology, which is a joint program between the University of Maryland, Baltimore and the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Jennifer Albrecht, who leads the Master of Science and the Certificate Programs in Clinical Research. And Dr. Tony Pollan, who leads the Master of Science Program in Human Genetics and Genomic Medicine. And finally, well, actually not finally, Wendy Lane is the Director of the Preventive Medicine Residency Program, Wendy, and Dr. Anthony Harris, who leads the department's medical student education program and is also the head of the Division of Genomic Epidemiology and Clinical Outcomes. I have just a few more individuals before we let these folks sit down. Um, I'd like to um, recognize a couple of the other lead administrators in the department. Dr. Soren Benson, I don't know if Soren is with us. No, Soren's not here. He heads our biostatistics division. And Joanne Dorgan, who is probably Zooming. Um, Joanne, um, please stand up. And um, Istvan Merkenthaler, uh, our translational toxicology leader. And our newest division leader is Man Sharat. And I don't know if they're able to be with us today, but let's have a round of applause for those that are here. And to complete this group, I'd like to recognize all the other epidemiology and public health faculty that are joining us today. Um, this entire group of dedicated individuals continue to grow and build the department's efforts in research, education, and community service. Thank you all for your continued dedication to the work the department and the School of Medicine do. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge our staff that had a hand in coordinating today's ceremony. And more than that, our staff that keep us, the faculty and administration, on track and moving programs forward. We have an outstanding staff in this department, and I really want to thank them all for their effort. And particularly today, I'd like to recognize if they would stand Justine Golden, I know she's here, there she is. Um, Kiona Jones, she might be, there she is. Tina Kramer, American, Tina, she's taking pictures in the front row. Cara Longo, Cara. Andrea Manning, she might be out at the table and you'll see her on your way out. Lauren Schmand, um, Sharinity Sharma, and John Shinnick, John, and uh, Aaron Walton. Aaron, thank you all for your tremendous service. And next, I'd like to recognize the family members and friends of our graduates. If they can stand, I know um, it would be, would be good to see you as well, family members and friends of our graduates. The, the, support, the support that you have given our graduates, not, not only through this challenging time of when they're in training, but before that is really, really notable and really important because your role in getting them to where they are is something that we can't forget and we need to always be mindful of. So thank you for all you've done to help us do what we do. And last, but certainly not least, 
I'd like to acknowledge our graduates. And our graduates will get to come up here. So I won't ask you to stand now. Um, we're really here to celebrate. Graduates are over here, right? On this side? Yes, I'd like, we're really here to celebrate your accomplishments and what you've done during these last few years. You've lived through an historical period in the world that has been marked by tremendous hardship for so many people around the world. You've worked extremely hard through the sometimes near daily curveballs presented by the pandemic. And we applaud you for these accomplishments. Your graduation is a true testament to your resilience to manage and work with these unusual, unexpected, and unprecedented circumstances. You've done it, and you should be very proud of yourselves for doing that. Some days I know you weren't sure where classes were going to be held. Certainly doing your research projects where you needed to be out of the university and in field settings were tremendous challenges. What are we permitted to do? Do we need to wear a mask? Do we, are we allowed to talk to somebody in person? Do we have to transition to doing our work by Zoom? How do we do all of these things? And day to day, things were changing. I hope you can look back on this as an experience that made you a better public health epidemiologist, certainly has built flexibility. And I think flexibility is a true sign of resilience. Those who can be flexible and move with changing times are the ones that are gonna have the greatest pleasures in life in the future. They're also gonna accomplish the most. You should be proud of yourself and we are very proud of you. And we are all um, just so pleased that we've been able to work with you. I think you'll look back years from now and say, meet somebody who lived through this period and say, wow, we across the whole world live through this period together. What an amazing feat. What an amazing feat. It seems that today, more than ever, we need individuals who are prepared to make an impact in the fields of public health, epidemiology, gerontology, human genetics and genomic medicine, and clinical research. And I believe our programs have set you on the path to success. And that each of you will have a positive impact, whether it be in the local community, within our state, across the nation, or elsewhere in the world. The training you have and the resilience you've displayed set you up for many career paths, some of which are already charted and waiting for you to apply for and accept, and others still not created, and that you will create as you observe the needs to create them in the future. Actually, I believe that is gonna mark the next 20, 30, 40 years. I think the changes that are happening so rapidly in the world are the ones that you're gonna observe and say, well, I know how to do that. I can do that. And I can make a difference in a different way that may not be there waiting for you. And you eventually will be in positions to create the opportunities for others to make those contributions. You're really the leaders of the future. And you should think of yourself as being prepared to, through this period to make that difference. So thank you for that tremendous ability and move forward. I'd now like to ask Dr. James Caper to share a few words with our graduates. Dr. Caper is the James and Carolyn Frankel Distinguished Professor, the Vice Dean for Academic Affairs, and the chair of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology here at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. 
Dr. Kaper. Good morning. Thank you very much, Jay. It's always a pleasure to be here uh, at the <coughs> graduation ceremonies, just be they December or, or May for the epidemiology program. So on behalf of Dean E. Albert Reese in the School of Medicine, I want to extend our heartiest congratulations to today's graduates. I also want to extend my congratulations to the parents, family members, and friends who have supported our graduates throughout this journey. Myself, having been in the audience at multiple graduation events for our children, I can certainly understand the pride that you must feel in your graduates today. I'm particularly pleased to be here at the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health graduation ceremonies because I have both personal and professional connections to the field of epidemiology. When I was early on in my research career uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, I developed some of the first uh, techniques for use for the field of molecular epidemiology in terms of looking at patterns of con connecting different outbreak strains to each other. And also de develop vaccines for the prevention of, of uh, cholera in particular, a huge global health problem. As a young faculty member in the School of Medicine here, I had a one of my many postdoctoral fellows was a young epidemiologist named Dr. Glenn Morris, who went on to become the chair of this department of epidemiology and uh, before J Magaziner. And on a personal note, uh, I first uh, met my wife when she was, uh, was, she's an infectious disease physician, Carol Tackett, many you know, but I first met her when she was an EIS officer at CDC, at the Epidemiological Intelligence Service officer at CDC. I was in Baltimore, she was in Atlanta, we met in New Orleans actually at a meeting, uh, but that's another story. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, another connection I have is uh, our daughter is an epidemiologist, as it turns out. And so Liz is, uh, after uh, she did a summer rotation here in this department, working with Anthony Harris, Dan Morgan, Carrie Tom, Mary Claire Rokeman, uh, uh, various other people here in terms of looking at bacteria, antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so this summer experience she had as she was an undergrad was her first exposure to, uh, to epidemiology. And so she eventually went on to get a MPH and PhD in epidemiology from UNC School of Public Health, postdoc at UVA. And she's now assistant professor at uh, the Emory School of Public Health. And so our family is just always, but we'll always be grateful to this department for the training the, and mentoring that our daughter received in this department. So I uh, can just to the graduates and you'll look back to and think about what, what great training and what great mentoring you received in this department. So anyway, those are some of the reasons that I'm particularly uh, feel connected to, to epidemiology. But the, the general public is uh, really not familiar with epidemiology and public health until there's, until there's a crisis. Um, and I needn't belabor the, the COVID-19 the pandemic then, and people are much more aware of epidemiology uh, and public health. But when that hopefully uh, eventually resides, uh, I'm afraid the, the public health interest is, uh, will, will diminish again. And the public health, even besides the, uh, the pandemic, uh, I mean, the public health, uh, the general public doesn't know the public health implications of just keeping things normal for non-infectious diseases in terms of, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, aging, opioid uh, crisis then, and just that uh, the continual stream of public health issues that are always going on, even when there's not a global pandemic. And so it's going to be these graduates today who were dealing with this current crisis and then future crisis, and then the general baseline uh, of public health issues. And uh, hopefully to, so that they don't emerge into, into crises then. But I'm convinced that of the training that you received here in this department, 
that after you graduate today, you'll be ready to, to go on and, and make tremendous contributions to the public health of the, of the city, the state, the country, and, and the world. So congratulations to all our graduates then, and come back and stay in touch with us. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Carol Rattay. Dr. Rattay is the director of the Delaware Division of Public Health and was appointed to the position in May of 2009. She serves as the Delaware State Health Officer and leads a department of over 700 employees. Dr. Rattay is board certified in pediatrics and preventive medicine and has practiced pediatrics for nearly 14 years. Previously, she worked at Namor's Health and Prevention Services, where she led their childhood obesity initiative and efforts to prevent overweight in primary care settings. Dr. Rattay also provided weight management clinical care at the Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children in Wilmington and has published multiple articles in the field of childhood obesity. Between September 2001 and June 2004, Dr. Rattay served as a senior public health advisor to the Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary of Health in the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion in the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington. In 1992, Dr. Rattay earned a medical doctorate from the Medical University of Ohio and then completed her pediatric residency at Georgetown University and a preventive medicine residency here at the University of Maryland. Dr. Rattay earned a Master of Science in Epidemiology from the University of Maryland in 2001. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Zoology and Pre-Medicine, which she received in 1987 from Ohio Wesleyan University in Delaware, Ohio. We're extremely proud to call you an alumna of our preventive medicine residency program and our master of science program, Dr. Rattay, and we're honored that you're here with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Magaziner and Dr. Caper, and a special thank you to Dr. Wendy Lane for the invitation to be here. Um, it's so great to be back to my alma mater program, a program that really has had such a profound impact on my career. Good morning, class of 2022. Congratulations to you for reaching this milestone. I know you have worked hard and sacrificed much and um, it was helpful to hear and some of the trials and tribulations that you have been through. What a crazy time to go through uh, graduate training programs. Um, but um, clearly you have developed some resiliency throughout this experience and um, you should be extremely proud of yourselves. In my opinion, this is a really exciting time to be a part of public health. So here you are graduating and some of you may be very clear about what your next steps are and some of you may not be and either is okay. So my first point I wanna make today is, is by obtaining degrees in epidemiology and public health, you are opening many doors and your path may meander along the way. I think that this has been hit on already. Let it meander. Your path, from now going forward, it may not be straight. There are so many different directions you can explore, government at all levels, international work, grassroots community engagement, direct service delivery, vaccine development, research, academia, 
working in corporate America, the options are endless. You may not know what you want to do with your degree, but you are in a fortunate position of being able to have a career that can, and, and I believe should, evolve over time. So you might want to get comfortable with not having all the answers about your future right now. And I'm hoping my story might set one example. So in eighth grade, I decided I'm going to become a pediatrician. And I set straight down that path, really with blinders on in many ways. I finished my MD, I did my pediatric residency, went straight into private practice. And about three years in, I realized this wasn't gonna be the last stop for me. And frankly, it was really hard for me to accept that I wanted and needed something different or more for my career. In fact, I was really pretty critical of myself for not being satisfied with being a partner in this great pediatric practice. But knowing my interest in healthy lifestyles a friend suggested that I think about public health and preventive medicine, which sadly, I just wasn't really that aware of prior to that time. Uh, but once I was, I knew this was my path. The more I learned, the more certain I was uh, that this was meant to be for me. And I will always be grateful that I was led to the University of Maryland in 1999. I will always be grateful that I got to meet uh, Dr. Judy Rubin at that time who just got me and my colleagues so excited about preventive medicine as a, a part of my journey. Now, like you, I chose the University of Maryland to obtain my advanced degrees. And when I got here, I felt like a kid in a candy shop, like just looking at the, the different options that I was going to learn here and that I did learn here. I, I loved my epidemiology courses. I loved that year where I focused on getting my master's degree in epidemiology. And then, then my second year, I got to work in Washington, D.C. In, um, at HHS in Atlanta at CDC and here in Baltimore at the State Department of Health. I learned things and met people who have influenced my career since. So while I was doing my practicum year, I met um, the for former Assistant Surgeon General Dr. Woody Kessel, and um, a, a Dalton Paxman, who's now the HHS Region 3 Director, and they've been a part of my career since that time. So I did a practicum from my preventive medicine residency, which landed me a full-time job there. And then when my husband and I relocated to Delaware, they both helped me find Nemours while Nemours was standing up a, um, a new division on um, health promotion and disease prevention. So a point I want to make here is how important it is to grow your network, develop relationships, nurture and cherish those relationships on, on the way. It's so meaningful. All right, so here I am at Nemours Health and Prevention Services, really loving my job, getting to stand up this new organization, working on a statewide childhood obesity initiative. And five years in, a colleague literally knocks on my door. George is his name. Now, George was good friends with the newly elected governor and uh, very good friends with the person who'd been selected as the cabinet secretary for our agency. And George says, you know, what do you think about being the public health director for the state? And I'm, I'm like, okay, my daughter's one. My son is three. I said, George, I would love to do this, but not right now. And he said, well, why don't you just meet Rita, the new cabinet secretary? And I did 13 years ago and the rest is history. Um, and suddenly I'm leading this division that has almost a thousand people, um, over $200 million budget now. And um, lots of internal challenges in the division itself, but also Delaware is not the healthiest state. So lots of health issues to, to tackle. And I knew it was a big leap and I was intimidated, but I followed my heart. I trusted my instincts and I'm so glad that I did. Serving in this role has been the greatest honor of my lifetime and embracing this mission to protect and promote the health of all Delawareans was what I was meant to do for the, the past 13 years. 
In these 13 years, I've led our state through two pandemics, H1N1, which was right when I started, and now COVID-19. Um, in the meantime, though, we've worked uh, with many partners on comprehensive approaches, uh, such as infant mortality. We've been able to drive down our infant mortality rate by 30%. We've been able to drive down our cancer mortality by 15%. Um, we're focusing on harm reduction efforts, prevention efforts around substance use disorder, um, in improving our infrastructure, including data sharing, focusing on health equity, addressing social determinants of health. Again, here I am a kid in a candy shop, right? There's just so many exciting things that, that you can do in public health. And in my opinion, being in public health is a, it's a real gift. It is a calling that helps improve the lives of others, the quality of life, the length of life, and lessens the burden of disease for others. And my job has been so very rewarding and it is never boring. This to-do list is long, the hours relentless, but I love this work. So here's my second key point. It's important to do work that matters, work that you feel is making a difference, work that you feel is making the world a better place. And I believe that is the gift of, of public health. You will find your purpose in the world of public health and the work we do, it matters. You may not feel that way every day, with every email, with every Zoom call, but at the end of the day, when you place your head on your pillow, allow yourself to acknowledge that you are making a difference. And one of the greatest achievements, in my opinion, in our division's history was becoming a nationally accredited state public health agency. Maybe that's not super exciting to many people, but for us, this was really a key strategy to build our infrastructure um, and to be able to improve the way that we respond to whether it's crises or that we tackle the health issues in, in front of us. It's an approach that helps us be fluid so we can constantly evolve in response to those community needs. During the, my time in public health, my time, my, my team and I have worked with many, many partners throughout our state. And so any improvement I ever talk about, it's not just public health as an agency alone. Everything we do is collaborative. It involves partnerships. Several initiatives that I've had the pleasure of work on, working on I, are truly exhilarating to me, which is, I think, a fun part of this work when you get really excited about what you're doing. One of the initiatives that we call the Delaware CAN initiative, uh, which some of you may be familiar with because uh, University of Maryland has been helping to evaluate the program, uh, but this is a uh, comprehensive approach to increase access to effective contraception. We had a high unintended pregnancy rate in Delaware, and there's a lot of health and social outcomes uh, related to unintended pregnancies. Babies and moms do better when they have uh, their babies when, when they're ready for them. So we've been able through this comprehensive public health approach to decrease unintended pregnancy in our state somewhere around 25%. You all will tell us the real numbers when we, when we get there. Um, another initiative that is, it feels like my life's work. It, um, when I got to this division, I realized we didn't have local public health in Delaware. We didn't have community engagement. We um, were really missing key work that, you know, should be taking place. And so it took, it took a number of years to really even develop enough of an infrastructure to um, stand up this initiative we call Healthy Communities Delaware. And it's in partnership with the University of Delaware and our Delaware Community Foundation, but it, it's a place-based approach working with communities, um, in fact, helping communities to drive changes addressing social determinants of health. So it's our strategy to really tackle equity um, uh, with communities in the, in the lead. And we're already seeing some great um, efforts, more dollars being invested, more alignment of, of efforts. And so, um, for me, it's just fun to see, you know, things come to fruition um, that's meaningful, that you feel is making a difference. 
COVID, I could spend all day talking about COVID. I don't want to. Um, <laughs> these two years have been the most challenging of, of my career, but I am so immensely proud of public health team in Delaware and public health across the nation. And it really is pretty exciting. Dr. Caper mentioned this, but you know, people know now know, the public now knows what an epidemiologist is. Isn't that great? They also know what social distancing means and quarantine means. Like the public now understands better what public health does. But public health has really struggled as far as, you know, that the response has really strained our, our staff, physical and mental health for two exhausting years. We've had to remain calm and professional while we're getting attacked from many different directions. Um, and it's hard, it's been very hard. Um, I even had a vaccinator who had a, a gun pulled on him uh, because, you know, vaccine is bad. Um, I mean, it's, I don't think any of us ever imagined some of the um, uh, polarization that we would experience. But the reality is, by far, the vast majority of the public is supportive of these public health efforts. And we did some polling in our state. And well, a lot of people, they're silent, you don't really hear from them. Most people know that public health saved lives public health decreased the morbidity and the burden of illness on our population. And the public is appreciative of what we have done. So again, when you put your head on your pillow at the end of the day, allow yourself to acknowledge that the work that you are doing makes a difference. And my final point that I wanna make is about staying true to your values at all time, which may sound um, a little odd to you that I'm bringing this up, but let me start with a, a story. When I first got this job, um, I met this individual, uh, Dr. Paul Jarris, who was the executive director of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, which is kind of my affiliation, uh, the, the association that, that I work with most closely. And um, like how I've connected with many colleagues, um, Paul was, Paul's a runner, I'm a runner, so we used to go and run together. And, and on one particular run, he, he said something to me that, I, 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 that has really stayed with me all along, which is to make sure that you stay true to your values. He said, I was gonna be pushed at times to do or say things that are inconsistent with what I believe or, and value. And he adamantly advised me to resist ever acting in a way that's inconsistent with my values or depart from what I believe in and what is right. So my advice to you is if you ever reach a point where you need to draw the line to protect your core values, raise your voice and do it. Now, if you've not done so, make sure you do take some time to discover what your personal values are. And there's actually some you know, great apps for this. Um, but your, your values, they define what's meaningful in life to you. And, and they're the justification for who you are. And at your deepest, most personal level, they give you a sense of purpose. They help carry you through the day. But I think what's really helpful, what I found when difficult situations or ethical dilemmas arise, your core values help guide you in decision-making. They can give you clarity during possibly chaotic and confusing times, and they lead you to make wise decisions that set you up for success in the long term. Now, sometimes it's extremely challenging to find consensus between the science of public health and politics. We've seen that a lot, right? And if you're ever at that intersection, it's wise to keep your own values at the forefront and speak up. Sometimes that means having courageous and difficult conversations. But I've learned that most people respect the willingness of others to stay true to what matters to them personally. Um, just a quick story, in my first year, um, so the, the governor releases a budget, a recommended budget in January of every year. And as part of his team, you know, we're supposed to support his budget publicly. Well, I see the budget and it had completely eliminated tobacco prevention dollars, tobacco prevention, which came from tobacco settlement dollars. 
And I, I lost sleep over this because I'm pretty new in my role at this point, but I'm like, there is no way that I can publicly defend the elimination of tobacco prevention dollars. So I went to my boss, Rita, who I mentioned before, and, um, and I told her, I said, I, this is a huge dilemma for me. Like, there's no way I can, you know, go to the our, uh, finance committee hearings and defend this. And she's like, thank you for telling me, I understand. We won't put you in that position. It, it actually turned out that it, it had been an accidental um, uh, um, removal of that line. Um, but because it was the recession, only you know half of it was put back in, but at least half of it was put back in. And, um, but still they did not have me defend that publicly, which I was really, really grateful. There is one point here though that I wanna make that there is a difference between staying true to your values and, and always getting your way. Because in public health, we, we don't always get our way. In fact, we often don't really get our way. Um, we have to remain open and listen to the many different perspectives among our colleagues, partners, and the people we serve. Proactively interacting with others, acknowledging their viewpoints, and building consensus are value traits and are really key to public health progress. So whether it's to leverage funding, implement aligned initiatives, make policy changes together in public health, we have to work collaboratively with partners. Um, and Delaware is the envy of, of many other states because we're, we're small and we do um, tend to work closely with others. We've, we have a number of coalitions through which we're able to really bring people together, align resources and, and, and get things done. Um, and it's exciting to see when that happens. But just remember to make progress, sometimes compromise is necessary. And many times a step forward is a positive. But make sure that you know your values and you know what lines you cannot cross in order to remain true to yourself. Crossing that line might be working with tobacco or big pharma. Um, it might be when our leaders are going against the science or, or worse, if we're not able to speak up for the science or it might be when someone that we're working with is spinning a story or lying, which happens sometimes too. But if you know and you stay tuned into your values, you will recognize these moments when you encounter them. And if you feel you're being pushed to compromise your values, speak up, push back, and resist. But at the end of the day, don't be afraid to move on. So remember that you have the gift of being a public health professional. Use your gift in ways that brings you satisfaction, meaning, and joy, and allows you to be true to yourself. In my opinion, there has never been a better time to work in public health. Embrace public health spirit, which transcends and improves people and places that are burdened by disease and social ills. Public health workers make a difference all day, every day. And no matter what avenue of public health you pursue, try to remember it is okay to meander. In fact, it's great to allow your career to take you in different and unexpected directions. Make sure you're doing work that you find meaningful and makes you feel like you're making a difference and know your values and stay true to them. It's so exciting to be a part of the public health family and our world will benefit greatly from your contributions. Good luck to you and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rattay. It was, I was inspired. Um, and um, I hope our graduates were, it was really quite a very, very well thought out and very provocative um, set of principles as well as very, very personal and meaningful examples. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so next, the, the department um, has several annual awards, and each year during this ceremony, we announce the annual award recipients. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce each award presenter, who will then talk about the award and the recipients. 
Um, our first presenter will be Dr. Jessica Brown, who will present the Langenberg Endowment and Epidemiology and Women's Health Award. Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Magaziner. I am so pleased to join you all this morning as we celebrate the accomplishments of our graduates and those receiving awards today. I really mean this. I am very excited to be back in person to celebrate these milestones. It is my honor to begin this section of our program and present the Dr. Patricia Langenberg Endowment in Women's Health and Epidemiology Award. Before the awardee is recognized, I want to extend my respect and appreciation to my colleagues who serve on the award selection committee we all agree that it is a pleasure serving on this committee to honor Dr. Langenberg's legacy to our department by fostering the education and career development of doctoral trainees. This endowed award was established shortly after Pat retired in 2015. And after 25 years of dedicated service to the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. The endowment provides merit-based awards to doctoral students to support dissertation or other research travel to professional conferences, experiential learning opportunities, or other educational needs. This award has been given out for five years, and remarkably, today we recognize our 11th awardee. Our growing number of scholars is possible due to the sustained generosity from Dr. Langenberg. Dr. Langenberg, if you've been able to join us today, could you please stand for recognition? We will recognize her in absentia. <laughs> Dr. Lagenberg and her family have long served as champions of higher education, either directly as educators, mentors, and leaders, or indirectly through considerable philanthropy. Many of us here today have been taught by or were mentees of Pat, and today we welcome one more scholar. The spring 2022 awardee is Jonathan Lawton. Jonathan is a second year doctoral student in the program of epidemiology and human genetics in the molecular epidemiology track under the mentorship of Dr. Mark Travasas. As an undergraduate, a field experience in Kenya solidified his interest in public health. Here in his graduate program, he's been impressively productive working with data from Nigeria and Mali. As this semester's sole recipient of the Dr. Patricia Langenberg Endowment in Women's Health and Epidemiology Award, Jonathan was awarded funds to travel to Uganda to participate in the collection of blood specimens from pediatric malaria patients to analyze the plasmodium parasites gene expression. This work is fundamental to understanding the complex host and parasite infections in interactions, excuse me, in severe malaria infection. Better characterizing the pathogenesis of infection can assist in identifying promising targets for broadly protective vaccine. While Jonathan had a schedule conflict and is unable to join us today to be recognized in person, he did send some remarks for me to share. The legacy of Dr. Patricia Langenberg inspires and emboldens me to devote myself to a research career where I can influence large scale change in the health of women and children worldwide. I truly believe that the Langenberg Endowment Funds will be instrumental to my development as a successful independent researcher in global infectious disease epidemiology. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Lawton. Thank you, uh, Jessica. Um, the um, next presenter is Dr. Ann Grubaldini, who will present the Gerontology Early Career Development Award. Thank you. Um, I just I learned that I was going to be giving this speech about an hour ago, um, so I do not have any full notes. Um, I want to apologize to our, our awardee for not having extensive background. I mean, I, also, I know her personally, but I um, so I, we had to look up some stuff and, and I had to think of some things off the top of my head. 
Um, the uh, Gerontology Early Career Development Award this year goes to Jocelyn Brown. And Jocelyn um, also cannot be here with us today, but if she's joining us online, I apologize again for the brief remarks. Um, Jocelyn is a rising third year gerontology doctoral student. Um, and she plans to study leisure time behavior of older black adults, describing barriers to leisure and developing interventions to improve and increase leisure activity in this older adult population. Um, Jocelyn's a joy to work with. I've had her in a number of my classes and she is the student representative to our gerontology steering committee and is a very vocal uh, proponent for her fellow students. So um, I, we will hear much more from Jocelyn in the future and congratulations, Jocelyn Brown. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Diane Marie St. George, um, who will be presenting the Rene Royak Shaler Memorial Endowment Award. Dr. St. George. So good morning, everyone. At this time, it's my great honor to present the Renee Royak Shaler Memorial Endowment Award. Dr. Royak Shaler joined the faculty of our department in 2002 and was instrumental in the development of our Master of Public Health program, eventually leading us through to its initial accreditation. Dr. Royak Shaler taught and mentored students in the PhD, MS, and MPH programs within our department. She was also an active researcher in the areas of health disparities, health behavior, women's health, cancer prevention, and community engagement. We are pleased to be joined today virtually by Dr. Royak Shaler's daughter, Ms. Magda Shaler Haynes, who like her mother is a staunch advocate for women's health and health equity and has an illustrious career as a public health attorney. After Dr. Royak Shaler's untimely passing in 2011, Ms. Shaler Haynes and her family established an endowment fund in our department to honor her mother's legacy and memory. Through this extremely generous gift, we have been inspired and informed by internationally renowned health equity speakers in the annual Royak Shaler Memorial Lecture Series. And additionally, Every year, we have honored one to two deserving students with the prestigious Royak Shaler Memorial Endowment Award. This fund provides merit-based awards to students in the PhD, MS, and MPH programs. It recognizes excellence in academic work, research, and or service in any of the areas that were deeply important to Dr. Royak Shaler. This year, we have two award recipients whom I will introduce in alphabetical order. Firstly, Jennifer Marie Haddock Cook. Ms. Cook holds an Associate in Arts degree in Psychology from Oklahoma City Community College and a BA in Psychology with a minor in Sociology from University of Central Oklahoma. She joined our doctoral program in Gerontology in 2018. She has been actively engaged in professional service, demonstrating leadership in multiple ways. She was a member of the Hispanic Success Initiative the Oklahoma Hispanic Leadership Association Planning Board, the Psy Chi Social Media Board, the Meyerhoff Student Advisory Board, and the UMB Graduate Student Association Executive Board. She has been the recipient of multiple awards, including the UCEO, University of Central Oklahoma Foundation Scholarship, and multiple awards for transformation in global and cultural competence, leadership, service learning, and civic engagement. In 2020, she earned the award for the best oral presentation on applied science research and aging given by the Center for Research on Aging at the University of Maryland. Ms. Cook is passionate about eliminating health disparities and is currently working on her dissertation where she is focusing on how health inequities specifically for older women of color are maintained by social systems and structures. So congratulations on being a 2022 Renee Royak Shaler awardee. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think we're going to 
Now on to Ms. Helena Salam. Ms. Salam is an MPH graduate having just completed, as of yesterday, the global health concentration as a part-time student while working full-time in the area of childhood obesity prevention. Helena received her bachelor's degree in community health from the University of Maryland School of Public Health in College Park. As an undergraduate student, Helena served as a College Park Scholars Ambassador and was selected to Phi Sigma Pi National Honors Fraternity, serving as a national delegate. In addition to recognition for excellence in the classroom, Helena has distinguished herself through leadership and a dedication to service. She served her college community through her role as a help center volunteer, assisting students in crisis, providing non judgmental, client centered counseling, and engaging the campus in an important dialogue about mental health services. Helena's commitment to community service, public health, and health equity have been strengthened throughout all of her academic internships, including serving as a public policy engagement intern at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and leading wellness events for senior citizens as well as middle school children. Since February of last year, Helena has been working with the Vermont Oxford Network on a project which became her MPH practicum. She evaluated the impact of Ethiopia's first ever master's program in neonatal nursing practice. Her recommender states that, and I quote, while Helena's practicum project places her at the forefront of global neonatal nursing scholarship, the desire to lead this project was not based on the attention that her manuscript will garner. Helena quickly and astutely recognized the ability of this work to contribute to the global health equity agenda, as there are massive and tragic inequities in global newborn health, with 99% of preventable newborn deaths occurring in low and middle income countries. Inequities exist in quality of care, experience of care, and importantly, in the human resources dedicated to providing care." End quote. This is just the beginning of Helena's lifelong contribution to global health equity, and we can't wait to see what she does next. Helena, congratulations on being a 2022 Renee Royak-Shela awardee. Thank you. Well, congratulations to both of you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Anthony Harris, who um, will be presenting the Medical Teaching Award. Dr. Harris. First off, I just wanted to um, congratulate all of the graduates. And it's nice to be live as an infectious disease physician. I can definitely say that. Um, I'm going to be um, initially brief to the point, and then I'll, I'll um, elaborate a little bit more. I'm honored to be presenting the Medical Student Teaching Award to Dr. Mary Claire Roglin. For those of you who enjoy sports, there's a terminology that's bandied about in the last couple of years referred to as GOAT. When I first heard it, I'm like, what, what, what does that mean? It means uh, greatest of all time. And I think that Mary Claire deserves that type of accolade, both in terms of her teaching and in terms of her commitment towards the department. 
since I figured Jay may get a little angry at me if I just left the stage after that one sentence comment, I'll elaborate a little bit more on why I, I feel that way about Mary Claire. So let me, let me transition a little bit to um, the importance of teaching and um, some quotes. Better than a thousand days of diligent study is one day with a great teacher. Mary Claire is a great teacher and I've witnessed that over the last 23 years. Another quote states that the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, the great teacher inspires. Mary Claire inspires her students, both in the classroom, which as many of you know is becoming tougher and tougher as the students are uh, multitasking on their computers, checking their phones, and um, I'm guilty of that as well, unfortunately. So Mary Claire inspires in that mechanism, but she also inspires relative to this award in the MD, PhD students in her day-to-day -day mentoring with the students. I've been fortunate enough to know Mary Claire since 1999. She helped recruit me along with um, Glenn Morris. She's been my division head. I'm now her division head, my colleague, and my friend. Mary Claire does everything the right way, and teaching is no exception. She's passionate about teaching. She's not one of these people who, when her research is taken off, has said, well, I'm not going to teach anymore. She's maintained passion and dedication to teaching. For those of you who don't know, we, over the 22 or 23 years, have taught endless iterations of what we do for the four years of medical students. And over those um, years, Mary Claire has taught all four year, years of students in, in, in various forms. At present, she has most of her med school teaching to the first year med students where we have a week to teach them epidemiology and statistics. And she teaches um, a didactic lecture in clinical trials and also teaches a number of small groups where we teach them the important task of how to epidemiologically and statistically read the medical literature. During these years, I'm often seeing the evaluations, and no matter how much I try, most years I don't meet, Mar meet Mary Claire's evaluations of the students. She continually scores exceptionally high and never seems to learn that passion and the emotion that translates into high evaluations. She's also, as I alluded to, the director of the MD-PhD program, and I think this is where some of her passion really shines. It's been nice to see her re-energized, taking over that program from Dr. Michael Donenberg a number of years ago, and is really passionate about guiding them to successful PhDs, and most importantly, guiding them to successful careers. Mary Claire received her bachelor's degree from the University of Rochester. She got her MD from Johns Hopkins, and she did her internal med residency and chief residency and infectious disease fellowship here. She has over 90 publications, and she's had consistent funding from the CDC and the VA for over 20 years. In times like these, I think people often question, where are we going as a country? Where are our leaders going? And where are we going nationally? And I think, unfortunately, a lot of us often question where the moral compass is. We want our leaders to have a high moral compass. I always look up to Mary Claire because her moral compass is unbelievably great. She's a leader, and we hope to keep her in the department for another 20 years. Come receive this well-deserved award. Mary Claire will be fine if we take a picture without masks.
Thank you, Anthony, and congratulations again to Mary Claire. Uh, our next presenters are Gretchen Tucker, a student in the PhD program in gerontology, and Karishma Mahanti, a student in the PhD program in epidemiology and human genetics. They'll be presenting the epidemiology and human genetics and gerontology faculty mentoring award. Ms. Tucker and Ms. Mahanti. Hello, good morning, everyone. Congratulations to all the, uh, to the graduates as well as congratulations to all the awardees. Um, I will be presenting uh, the, uh, the faculty mentoring award for epidemiology and human genetics program, as well as the gerontology program. I am extremely honored and excited to present this award to one of my, uh, one of my mentors and one of my champions, uh, Dr. Catherine Berry. Um, and I just will give a brief introduction to Dr. Berry. She's a professor in the cancer epidemiology department and she focuses her research on health disparities in uh, prostate cancer. And she's been a great mentor to me um, as well as to a lot of other individual mentees, but she also teaches and guides students and has dedicated her time and effort and the research practicum class as well as individually mentoring students as they come along to their rotations. Um, I'll just share another brief story of how uh, Dr. Berry has been so supportive, even though I had a brief rot rotation with her my first semester uh, in the program. Um, every, every semester she checks in with me, makes sure how my, my progress is going. She was there for my proposal defense. And one of the most touching, um, touching moments for me when I was working with her is we were working on a paper together. And because I was doing the analysis, um, she like, checked in with me and was like, hey, would it be okay if I'm the first author on the paper? I have never had an experience where my mentor is asking me if that's okay. And of course it was okay, but it was just such, it was such a tender moment for me to understand. I think that's another reason why I've appreciated as a department is that everybody is it's such a collaborative, but such a nurturing department. And it's not about the different statuses, it's just about learning and doing good research. So congratulations, Dr. Bay, and thank you so much. I'm pleased now to introduce uh, uh, Shur Shurniti Sharma, a master of public health student, and she will present the MPH program faculty teaching and mentoring award. Ms. Sharma. Thank you, Dr. Magaziner, for that introduction, and hello, everyone. On behalf of the MPH students, it is truly my pleasure to present the 2022 Master of Public Health Teaching and Mentoring Award. This award recognizes excellence in teaching and mentoring by a faculty member in the School of Medicine's Master of Public Health program. For this award, the teaching component is based on the faculty member's passion for stimulating learning and generating intellectual curiosity both inside and outside a classroom setting. While the mentoring aspect is based on the faculty members' remarkable enthusiasm and success in guiding the professional growth of the MPH students. Each year, the MPH students can nominate one faculty member for outstanding teaching and mentorship. This year, there were several nominations, but one faculty member emerged as a clear winner. Students, students describe this awardee as a mentor and role model. 
Here are just a few specific student testimonials. One student noted that this faculty member is an incredible teacher and mentor and always finds a way to connect with the students on a personal level. This faculty member's feedback is genuine and demonstrates appreciation for hard work balanced by a push to the next level. Another student noted that since my first meeting with this faculty member, she has always been one of my favorites. This faculty member's door has always been open for me to ask questions, especially regarding the planning of my practicum experience. I feel very comfortable coming to this faculty member for assistance or advice if needed. A third student noted that this faculty member is versatile and promotes different ways of applying public health to various demographics that critically need advocating for, particularly in older adults. Now, please join me in congratulating the 2022 Master of Public Health Teaching and Mentoring Award recipient, Dr. Jessica Brown. Our last award will be presented by Evan Gombert, co-chair of the Public Health Student Association Leadership Board. He'll present the MPH Student Peer Recognition Award. Mr. Gombert. Thank you, Dr. Magaziner, for that introduction. The MPH Student Peer Recognition Award enables the MPH students to recognize a peer that examples exemplary teamwork, camaraderie, support, and respect for other students, and a passion for the field of public health. My fellow public health students and I were able to nominate a currently enrolled student, a classmate, really, for this honor. This year, there were several nominations, but we had one classmate that stood above the rest. This MPH student descri was described by their peers as a leader through their formal and informal roles that they held uh, during, uh, during the school year, uh, a team player, and was extremely supportive to their classmates through projects and other uh, outside uh, forms, and it was extremely respectful of the other students and their dedication and passion to the field of public health. So if you could please join me in congratulating the 2022 Masters of Public Health Student Peer Recognition Award recipient, Ms. Keona Jones. Thank you. The, um, thank you to all the award presenters and especially congratulations to the recipients. Next, um, we would like to acknowledge um, the two honor societies. <clears throat> Um, several students in the department were invited to join the Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society this academic year. We've asked Dr. St. George to recognize these students. Dr. St. George.
Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to recognize the students that were in invited to join the Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society as I was invited to join this uh, society way back in the old days when I was a master's student. The Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society was formed in 1897 at the University of Maine by 10 senior students, two faculty members, and the university president. They created a new kind of honor society, one that recognized excellence across all academic disciplines. At first, the honor society named itself the Lambda Sigma, Sigma Eta Society. Later, it was renamed to Phi Kappa Phi from the letters or the Greek words forming its motto, Philosophia Kratia Protan, that the love of learning rule humanity. Today, Phi Kappa Phi recognizes and promotes academic excellence in all fields of higher education and engages the community of scholars in service to others. This year, five epidemiology and public health department students met the Honor Society's criteria for induction, and these students were invited to join Phi Kappa Phi. So at this time, we'd like to recognize those students. We know that several of them may be joining us via Zoom, but if you are present, please come forward when you hear your name. Tammy Brown, MPH student. Kara Dooley, MPH student. Sydney Feldman, MPH student. I'm not doing this on purpose. Really. A. St. John, Master of Science in Epidemiology and Clinical Research. And Nicole Viviano, PhD program in Gerontology. Next, we will recognize our new inductees into the Delta Omega Honorary Society in Public Health. And the University of Maryland School of Medicine has a very active Delta Omega chapter led by Dr. Lori Edwards and Jessica Brown. Um, both of them will announce the 2022 Delta Omega inductees. Doctors Edwards and Brown. Well, thank you, Dr. Magaziner. First, I would like to recognize the other Delta Omega members that are here with us today. Our newly elected executive board includes chapter president, Dr. Jessica Brown, President-elect Rena Rambart, MPH program alum, Secretary Treasurer Joanna Henry, MPH program alum, and member at large Akiba Daniels, who's also an MPH program alum. Will these chapter members please stand along with all the officer Delta Omega members that are present? Please stand. Um, I've been honored to serve as president of the Beta Chapter Tau um, for the past two years and look forward to working with this new executive board in the coming year. Thank you all and please be seated. Um, more of Delta Omega. Um, it's the Honorary Society for Public Health. It was established in 1924 to recognize outstanding achievement in the new field. As such, members are selected for the, their contribution to and commitment for high standards of academic and professional competence and service. Membership in Delta Omega reflects the dedication of an individual to increasing the quality of the field, as well as to the protection and advancement of the health of all people. This is an occasion now for inviting new members into the society who share the same commitment and goals. 
We welcome them and this opportunity to recognize their achievements to earn this distinction. Today, we are pleased to announce the selected individuals for induction into the chapter under alumni, faculty, honorary, and student. For alumni, this selection is from graduates of the MPH program whose work in the practice of public health would serve as a model for future graduates of the program. Each academic year, the chapter may induct up to 50% of the number of student inductees. And for this academic year, that means the chapter may induct one alum. Several alumni were nominated by the membership committee and for each nominee, the committee reviewed if the individual was engaged in a public health career, continuing with schooling or not engage or engage in a public health career. The alumni inductee for the 2021-2022 academic year is Mabinte Conte. She is currently serving as a public health associate at the, at the Bizzle Group in Lanham, and Ms. Conte is unable to join us today as she is attending another family member's um, faculty or graduation. Her faculty, the selection is based on contribution to public health scholarship, teaching, and service. The faculty inductee for the 2022-2022 academic year is Dr. Sanaya Amr. Dr. Amr is a professor emerita within the School of Medicine and her current service to the MPH program includes serving on the MPH Executive Committee, serving as a judge for the MPH poster today. She's also recently served on the MPH Steering Committee, MPH Admissions and Progressions Committee and the MPH Curriculum Committee. Dr. Amr, please come forward. Um, for our honorary inductees, the honorary selection is based upon a person possessing exceptional public health qualifications and have attained a meritorious distinction in the field of public health. Each academic year, the chapter may induct one, no more than one honorary chapter member. This is the first year that the Beta Tau chapter is inducting an honorary member and the honorary inductee for the 2021-2022 academic year is Dr. Carol Thomas Rattay. As noted earlier this morning, Dr. Rattay is the director of the Delaware Division of Public Health, the 20, our 2022 EPH um, post-commencement ceremony keynote speaker and an alum. Dr. Rattay, please come forward. For students, student selection is based on academic excellence, commitment to the public health profession and leadership qualities. Each academic year, the chapter may induct up to 20% of that year's graduating class. And for this academic year, that means the chapter may induct three student members. The student inductees for the 2021-2022 academic year are Emmanuel Agaba, Sarah Katakuzi, and Jamie Seibel. Would the three of you please come forward? Okay. One more minute, everyone. Um, it is honor for us. It is an honor for us to have you join the society as a student, alum, faculty, and honorary member. You embody the mission and vision of Delta Omega. Your qualifications have been reviewed and acted on acted on favorably by the leadership of this chapter. 
We hope membership in the society is an honor for you as well. Membership in Delta Omega has special meaning in that you are dedicating yourself to continued excellence in the field of public health. As such, you ascribe to high standards of performance in all that you do. We will now ask you to take the oath to join Delta Omega. I will read the statements and please say I will after each statement. I aspire to demonstrate excellence in the practice in the field of public health. I will. I aspire to demonstrate excellence in research in the field of public health. I will. I aspire to demonstrate excellence in education in the field of public health. I will. I aspire to demonstrate excellence in academic achievement in the field of public health. The Beta Tau chapter is honored to induct all of these individuals into the Delta Omega Honorary Society in Public Health. Congratulations to all the new inductees. Each year, we ask a graduating student representative from the different disciplines to share a few words about their experience here at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. This year, the directors from the programs will introduce the student speakers. And first is Dr. Gruber Baldini will be, will be announcing one of the speakers from the gerontology doctoral program. Again, substituting in for Dr. Denise Warwick, who co-directs the dual campus UMB UMBC gerontology doctoral program. Um, our speaker this year is Dr. Rashmita Baj I'm going to say it wrong. Bajracharita Charaya. Um, Rashmita um, defended her dissertation and graduated in December 21. Her dissertation looked at examining post-hip fracture characteristics to explain sex differences in short and long-term hip fracture mortality. Um, I again had the pleasure of having Rashmi in a number of my classes. She was an outstanding student. I know her dissertation work has already been published in the journals of um, at journal JAGS, the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. Um, and she is now working in Germany doing epidemiology research and we're going to hear some remarks from her um, via a recorded message. everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, my program directors, uh, Dr. Orwick, uh, Denise Orwick, Dr. Joan Schumacher, uh, for giving me an opportunity to represent the uh, Gerontology PhD program at the graduation event today. <clears throat> um, like, like many of the students, when I joined the program, uh, I was not sure if I was cut out to be a doctoral student and gain a PhD degree. Uh, my doubts grew even more when my papers got rejected by journals and my abstracts got rejected. But I'm grateful that Dr. Orwick was always there for me and believed in me, even when I did not believe in myself. In my weekly meetings, um, she would make sure to remind me that I'm doing a good job and uh, making good progress in my dissertation. Uh, her wisdom, kindness, and support as my mentor really helped me get through some um, difficult times, both personal and professional. Um, <clears throat> uh, the journey of a doctoral student um, can be very isolating, and with COVID consuming almost half of my PhD journey, it was definitely more so. 
However, um, the gerontology program took extra steps to keep students engaged with each other, be it regular virtual um, Zoom meetings or just catching up with the students. Um, I remember receiving several calls from just being our program coordinator to just check in and see uh, if I was doing okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as a graduate research assistant working with Dr. Dania Keto in my first two years and Dr. Orwig, Dr. Magazina, and Dr. Goralnik for the rest of my time here, I received the opportunity to analyze cohort data, write manuscripts, and um, I even have two papers published so far. Uh, moreover, I was always encouraged to submit my work to internal or external conferences and for presentations. Uh, more recently, the gerontology program has been very active in social media and makes every effort to highlight achievements of the students by publications, presentations, and awards. Uh, for me, especially being a gerontologist with epidemiology training opened uh, several doors for employment. Even though I did not have an experience in cancer research, my epidemiology training, data analysis skill, and aging expertise made me stand out and I was able to secure a postdoctoral fellowship in uh, German Cancer Research Center at Heidelberg, Germany. I am thankful to the Gerontology Program for the continued support, um, the lifelong mentors and friends I made in this program, and uh, I can't wait to see uh, what lies ahead for me. Um, Ready to yeah. Andrew Rivaldini will will now um, introduce the next student from the epidemiology and human genetics doctoral program. This time I do have prepared notes, so that's good. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Doug Loesch, Douglas Loesch, um, who is uh, it was a um, Doug a crumb. <laughs> doctoral student in our um, human genetics track within the epidemiology and human genetics program. Uh, Doug came to us with a bachelor's in English from Messiah University um, at AS in life sciences from Montgomery College, and for many years was a um, special education teacher in middle school in Frederick County um, before joining us in 2017. Um, since he's been here, um, he has taken um, summer institutes in statistical genetics at the University of Washington, advanced gene mapping at Rockefeller University. Um, he has been funded by the T32 interdisciplinary program in cardiovascular disease, um, has had five publications, including a first author publication in the Annals of Neurology, three submitted papers, um, and 15 posters. Um, he is been very active. Um, he's one of the students when you ask and, and you need something, he'll show up and help you. Um, so he was um, the representative to our graduate program committee. Um, he was a TA for genetic epidemiology. He was on the planning committee on patient engaged genomic understanding and interpretation, the Penguin Initiative, a big sibling for incoming students. Um, and he was on the GPILS award selection committee. Um, his district, he defended his dissertation in April, working with Dr. Tim O'Connor, um, looking at addressing bias in genomics, genome-wide association studies and polygenic risk scores and Latinx cohorts. Um, and um, he'll give us a, he'll be giving us a speech and hopefully he'll be talking about his new experiences. But after he graduated, since he's graduated, he's now going to be a postdoctoral fellow at the AstraZeneca Center for Genomic Research and a visiting scientist at Cambridge University. Dr. Douglas Lynch. Thank you. So uh, lately I've been thinking about the contributions of peoples and events that provided me with the foundation to thrive in graduate school. And I do find this particularly important in a ceremony such as this where we acknowledge individual achievements to reflect on the collective work that makes such achievements possible. For me, my wife, Sally, that has always supported me and somehow did not think I was crazy when I said, as a middle school, middle school teacher at the time, mind you, that I want to get a PhD. Uh, my grandparents, Irene and Bill, shaped me into who I am today, instilling in me a sense of morality, empathy, and a strong work ethic. 
My grandmother, father, uh, farmer and mother of seven passed away in 2015. And my grandfather, a farmer, shoemaker and carpenter passed away of COVID in 2020. Both got to meet my daughter as she came into the world and my grandfather during my time here would ask me every week how school was going. Going generally interested despite only having an eighth grade education that predated 1950. I'm eternally thankful to them and truly we carry the triumphs, pains, and hopes of our families with us. Uh, now, uh, we are also shaped by the academic village that surrounds us here as well. I have immensely enjoyed my time in the program of, uh, for epidemiology and human genetics. Of, over the course of five years, I have undergone a transformation from a middle school teacher to a scientist. It still amazes me that at this time in 2017, I've been in the front of the classroom with 30 eighth graders. While I definitely enjoyed my time teaching, there are some advantages, such as I haven't had to consider classroom management when preparing this. Um, uh, so this is, not, this is not hyperbolic to say that I, this has changed, this program has changed the entire trajectory of my life. This has not been possible without the support and guidance from my mentor, Dr. Tim O'Connor, and my advisor, Dr. Tony Pollan, and my dissertation committee. Uh, EPH faculty members and course instructors provided me with a solid foundation for my dissertation research. And I had the opportunity to serve as a student representative for the graduate program committee. And I saw firsthand there the commitment of EPH faculty to supporting students. And speaking of my fellow EPH students, I've been so impressed by everyone's hard work and accomplishments and camaraderie. Uh, the awards today have, are certainly testament to that. I have gained lifelong friends and colleagues, in particular from the O'Connor Lab, where I conducted my training. I do want to mention that the O'Connor Lab currently boasts students from all three tracks, human genetics, epidemiology, and molecular epidemiology, and their, their collective expertise and passions are quite evident. And so to all faculty members and my fellow students, many thanks. And I really hope our paths uh, cross again someday, particularly as I said that we are going to England, and, but I hope, hope to see everyone in the near future. Thank you. Dr. Jennifer Albrecht will now introduce the um, student from the clinical research program, Dr. Albrecht. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce Sophia Dumbadzi a graduate of the Master's in Clinical and Epidemiology and Clinical Research, Clinical Research Track. Uh, Sophia got her degree in medicine from the University of Tbilisi in her native Georgia. And she practiced as a pediatric cardiologist there for several years. Uh, she mentored medical students, residents, and fellows um, before deciding to come to the United States in 2017. And she took a position as a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Stephen Davis's lab and hadn't been there very long. And she decided that she really wanted to pursue additional education in clinical research. And she joined our, our master's program and completed that degree this, this May and um, is looking forward to using her new skills as a clinician researcher and hopes to, to mentor and, and teach again in the future and possibly pursue a doctoral degree in cardiatric, uh, cardiovascular, sorry, epidemiology. Um, so I think uh, let's congratulate Sophia on her achievement and welcome her to the stage. Thank you, Dr. Albrecht, for the introduction. Hello to my fellow graduates, your family members, friends, faculty and staff in person and in Zoom, on Zoom. 
Today, I'm honored to represent my fellow graduates of the Master of Science in Clinical Research and Epidemiology and uh, Clinical Research degree program, and to convey my message um, to you on this special occasion. Congratulations on your education. We made it. We all have different stories how we came to this program, our aspirations, and what we hope for the future are distinct. However, we all share one common idea, that is to improve public health measures based on evidence and science. And today, while I stand here in front of this August audience, I feel that in this journey now, I have the required training skill sets to bring this change and need to focus on implementation. I'm sure my fellow graduates also agreed to this. However, nothing would have been possible without the excellent mentoring and uh, support of the faculty in this program. The mentors not only helped us with academic growth, but also shared their experiences in life, thus giving us a holistic development. Today, I could not think of better timing for this degree as it was obtained during unprecedented circumstances and emphasized three crucial pillars of research, perseverance, patience, and a positive approach to life. The COVID-19 pandemic also taught us to adapt rapidly, tested our resilience and strengthened our belief in science. I have yet to sink into the fact that I heard Dr. Anthony Fauci in person as a keynote speaker yesterday at our university-wide commencement event. We students could not ask for a better motivational speech and I'm humble and grateful to have obtained this degree despite all the obstacles we all had to face. I believe now that based on our academic standing, we have various options to make right decisions about our future, whatever career path we choose. And overall, we all feel pride in obtaining this degree from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, which I'm sure each one of us will invest in to bring about the change and make the world a better and safe place to live. Congratulations once again, a class of 2022 and good luck to all of you in your endeavors. Thank you. Our final student speaker is from the Master of Public Health program. And to introduce our speaker is Diane Marie St. George. So at this time, it is my distinct honor to introduce to you Dr. Sarah Katakuzi, who is graduating today with a Master of Public Health degree in the epidemiology concentration. Dr. Katakuzi holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Bachelor of Science in Psychology cum laude from Virginia Commonwealth University. She earned an MD from Eastern Virginia Medical School and completed internship and residency in internal medicine at George Washington University. She currently holds the rank of Associate Professor here at the School of Medicine in the Institute of Human Virology and is passionate about making a difference in the lives of those living with opioid use disorders. Sarah may not remember this, but she applied to the program on May 1st, 2018 for entry into our fall 2018 cohort. For those who do not know, our application cycle each year opens in August and closes on May 1st, giving applicants eight months to submit their application. So after eight months, 
we received her application just before the online portal closed. As a program director, I always wonder what a 99th hour application really means. Is this a person who did not get accepted into any of the other schools that they really wanted to attend and we were just a last ditch effort? Is this someone who thrives on the thrill of the last minute adrenaline? Is this a student who is unable to manage her time and is going to struggle to meet deadlines in her courses? One never knows. But anyway, we put her application on the admission committee's docket as she did make it before 11.59 p.m. on May 1st. So, I am a member of the committee, so I can speak on behalf of the committee. Sarah opened her goal statement as follows. A lifelong love of learning, a passion for public service, and a strong sense of delayed gratification led me to a career in medicine. And these same characteristics now drive me towards the study of public health. She went further to describe her work in AmeriCorps, her early years as a physician researcher. And then she stated, and I quote, I recognize through my experiences that public health can go where medicine cannot. Public health traverses research, advocacy, and policy, and seeks to find scalable solutions to fundamental problems. Public health does not rest in demonstrating a singular finding, but continues until there is a platform for change. I hope you really wrote that and didn't just take it from the internet because that would be embarrassing for you, okay? So my experience as a physician have reinforced that such ideology is aspirational, but necessary. And I want to be a part of it, end quote. After reading her goal statement and her glowing letters of recommendation and reviewing her impressive dossier, the committee had no choice but to conclude that this was a highly accomplished individual worthy of admission. So, despite my trepidation, we let her in. When she showed up at orientation, I was a little nervous. She was engaging, excited, and overall quite lovely. But then I said to myself, self, do not let your guard down. This one will break your heart. But let my guard down, I did. And now, here we are, four years later, and each application cycle, I anxiously await the gems that apply on May 1st at 11.59 p.m. Sarah, please come forward. Just to be clear, being an MPH student has not changed me. I will still submit everything right before the deadline. Um, so uh, thank you all so much. It's such an honor to be here um, and to follow up Dr. St. George. Uh, my name is Sarah Katakuri, and it's my honor and privilege to represent the Master of Public Health Program and graduating class of 2022. As was just mentioned, I'm somewhat of a historic landmark in the MPH program as both the oldest and longest running student potentially in the program's history. Um, so I have the advantage of four years of observation and experience, and I'd like to share some of the lessons I've learned from the MPH program with you today. The first lesson is that public health is a team sport whose execution involves an interdisciplinary group of individuals working in parallel from primary to tertiary prevention using different methods and perspectives to achieve the same goal. Individuals gravitate towards public health for a variety of reasons. For Anna Whitney, it was to explore health inequities within the Baltimore community. For Tammy Brown, a physician, it was to understand the prevention of chronic non-communicable diseases at the population level. For Helena Salam, it was to pursue an interest in global health, while for Jamie Seibel, a preventative medicine physician, to learn about the role of social determinants in health prevention. For me, 
I pursued public health to change my vision from the single patient in front of me to the health system. And in public health, this variety of motivations, backgrounds, and skill sets is not a hindrance, but the key to our success. The second lesson is that health cannot be separated from the social, economic, and legal systems that surround us. For the victims of the recent Buffalo massacre, as a physician, I understand that the cause of death was likely cardiac arrest, secondary to hypovolemic shock, secondary to a gunshot wound. But as a public health professional, I understand that the root cause is the syndemic of white supremacy and gun violence. And as a public health professional, I look upstream to ask the bigger questions. How can public health intersect with policy and law to prevent gun violence? How can we prevent food deserts where an entire community is served by a single grocery store? Now more than ever, this lens is a necessary refocus as personal health issues are twisted into political kindling. A third lesson that the MPH program has taught me is that public health requires strong leadership, but not the kind we've gotten used to seeing on TV. Public health has taught me that leadership is firm in its assessments of problems and data, but malleable in its approach to decision-making and consensus building. Leadership is professional and accountable, but approachable and attuned to the needs of the community. It prioritizes the collective push forward over the individual achievement and seeks not only to inform, but to engage and inspire. And what better example of leadership than the dedicated professors of our MPH program, of course themselves led by Dr. Diane Marie St. George. Dr. St. George, you are the beating heart of this program. And I know I speak on behalf of all the MPH graduates when I say, we could not have succeeded without you. I have to also note the invaluable contributions of Ms. Andrea Manning and the professors whose lessons will guide me for the remainder of my career, especially Dr. Lori Edwards and Dr. Jessica Brown. And speaking of guidance, I would be remiss not to mention the people in my own life that have made this graduation day possible. As a full-time faculty member and mom of two young children, my journey as a part-time student was at times like walking a tightrope across a canyon, blindfolded and juggling. But along the way, if that's the analogy, there were two major groups that guided me. The first is my work family, including my mentor and boss, Dr. Sham Kodalil, and my colleagues, Dr. Uh, Rolana Rosenthal and Rachel Silk. Thank you, not just for your acceptance, but for your active encouragement. Alana, you covered so many clinics, did so many presentations. I'm so honored to be your friend, colleague, and mentee. The second group is my family, those here and abroad. To my parents, mom and dad, I will never stop leaning on you. Thank you for all your prayers and your endless support. To my beautiful children, Elijah and Ezra, Finally, mama has done her homework. I, I know being in school has kept me very busy, but I hope that today you both understand that you're never too old to stop learning and that with hard work and the right people around you, you can achieve anything. And finally, to my husband, Mike, I could have never done this without you. All the weekends you took the kids, did the bath, put them to bed and told me to keep going. It's the small daily sacrifices that enabled this major achievement. A final lesson, public health professionals must be ready for anything. We've completed our degrees in the midst of a pandemic, a public health crisis the world has not seen. We've learned to be agile, to trust ourselves, to ask for help when required. Most of all, we've learned to confront the unknown not with a sense of command or confidence, but with curiosity. How can we make a difference? What is already in place? What does the community need? And this more than anything binds together the work of public health. We will go upstream. We will ask the tough questions. We will enter communities with a sense of respect and wonder. And we will approach health with the lens of the most good for the most people with a constant question to propel us forward.
how can we do better? To my fellow graduates from the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, I know that we are ready now for our next unknown and that we will leave things better than we started. Thank you so much. We're now going to uh, recognize the graduates and um, to um, announce them will be Aaron Walton. Hi everyone, I'm Erin Walton. It's my great honor to lead the recognition of our graduates. We'll begin by recognizing our graduates that are with us today in person. So if the graduates can please come forward. As we announce your name, please move to your academic program director for your certificate and then to Dr. Magaziner for a small gift from the department. Okay. With a PhD in epidemiology and human genetics epidemiology track, Oloshigun Ariyame. With a PhD in Epidemiology and Human Genetics, Molecular Epidemiology track, Doyanzala Bailey. With a PhD in Epidemiology and Human Genetics, Human Genetics track, Douglas Loesch. Then MS in Epidemiology and Clinical Research, Sophia Dumbate. MS in Epidemiology and Clinical Research, Tracy Sparks.
a Master of Public Health, Tamuno Saladia, Lorraine Dadonye Brown. Master of Public Health, Sarah Katakuri. Master of Public Health, Kalina Salam. Master of Public Health, Jamie Seibel. Master of Public Health, Anna Whitney. Now I'd like to recognize the graduates, the graduates that are joining us virtually today. We will begin by recognizing a dual degree student. The student is a PhD graduate from the gerontology program and MS graduate from the epidemiology and preventive medicine program, Rashmita Bajracharya. The next graduates that we will recognize are the PhD graduates in epidemiology and human genetics with the epidemiology and molecular epidemiology tracks, Elizabeth Humphreys, Basant Matawi, and Emily Stuckey. The next group of graduates that we will recognize are the PhD graduates in epidemiology and human genetics within the human genetics track, Megan Lynch and Hai Chen Zhang. We will now recognize the Master of Science graduates in Human Genetics and Genomic Medicine, Sarah Bromberek and Malika Mather. Now we will recognize the Master of Science graduates in Epidemiology and Clinical Research, Osman Ali, Amulya Baludi, Sydney Chavis, Shigong Fen, Dongwon Kim, Nadia Saif, Akash Shah, Ace St. John. And our next group of graduates that we will recognize are the graduates of the Certificate in Clinical Research, Sayed Hassan and Puna Mathur.
And congratulations again to all the Masters of Public Health students who were here with us today. Well, this is really what makes it worth it to see the excitement and see our graduates coming up, those that are here today, those that are out um, watching us um, in other parts of the world in their clinical practices or wherever they are. Um, this is what makes it a pleasure for me as a um, faculty member to be so involved with this group and our students and the school. So congratulations to all of the awardees, the Honor Society inductees, and of course our graduates. Um, I wanna be the first to welcome you into the Epidemiology and Public Health Alumni Organization, where you will join the over 550 alumni who have graduated from our programs. As alumni, you will have the opportunity to stay connected to faculty and classmates by joining our alumni committee or through our social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Remember, remember, we encourage you to stay in touch as we see this as a lifelong involvement with the department and with you as our graduates. We, we also wanna hear about your career accomplishments as we know you'll be making a big difference throughout your careers in this ever-changing world. I wanna thank everyone for joining us this morning and especially um, our graduates for being here and their families for helping us celebrate. And I wanna invite everyone for some light refreshments out in the atrium. <laughs> 